Welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Griego Kyle from Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. In this podcast, we talk about sustainable investing and how your portfolio reflects your values. Do your investments seek accountability from corporations that govern more and more of our society and even the lives we lead? Listen in as we explore the question Are you investing like you give a damn? Hello and welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Griego Kyle from Horizons Sustainable Financial Services. Good morning, Kim. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Eric? I'm doing fantastic. I am uh, still a little bit cold. It's still winter. Uh, for those that are wondering <laughs> if it's winter where I'm at, it's it's winter everywhere. <laughs> so. Yes, it's even winter in Santa Fe. Yeah. People forget that it's a very high elevation in Santa it Fe is. and it gets very cold here. And I am not a winter girl. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Either am I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's not my favorite season. I don't like to be cold. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah. let's let's get warmed up then. We're going to yeah. be talking. I think this is part three. If I remember right, you and I were talking yep. before the podcast, and you said this is part three in the series that you're doing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I I love yes. this topic. There was, I believe, 17, if I'm not mistaken, total goals. There's 17 goals, yes. Okay. And what are we covering today? So we're going to talk about number 14 and 15. At, when we started this, I said we weren't going to talk about them necessarily in order. Mm-hmm. Um, we right. would group them topically. And so we're going to talk about number 14, which is life below water, and number 15, life on land. Okay. So I, I, I like these two. Uh, Especially the life below water, which talks a lot about the ocean. Mm It's one of my mm -hmm. favorite topics. Uh, So yeah, we'll start with that one. And and yes, just as a reminder to to our listeners, the importance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is all about changing and working on sustainability, but changing the world and making it better, and and how we be a little more proactive in terms of of the Earth. And the world and the people, Mm -hmm. really about the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And now that you've said, you know, life below water, all I can think of is that crab from Little Mermaid, you know, singing (laughs) singing under the sea, right? (laughs) Under the sea. (laughs) It's just going through my brain right now. We don't have an audio clip and I'm not going to sing it, uh, but (laughs) y'all can, I'm sure the listeners right now, it's playing in their head and now it's going to be stuck for a couple days. It's going through my mind. And if I had prepared, I might have (laughs) sung a little line, but I'm not going to do that today. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right. So let's talk about under the sea or below the water. Below uh, the water. What, are, what yeah. is the UN saying? What's their goal? Yeah. So so we'll, let's talk about uh, the the problem and why it's important first. But you know, we we think about the ocean mm-hmm. and conserving water, the sustainable use of the oceans, marine life, fish. We eat a lot of fish, mm-hmm. right? We eat a lot of. Well, I don't eat shellfish because I'm allergic to it, but lots of people do. They love it. The ocean. Acidity, if you don't know this, most people probably don't, has increased by 26% since pre-industrial times because of what we're doing to Mm. it. It's expected to continue to increase rapidly by 100 to 150% by the year 2100. So in another 80 years, we're going to really increase the ocean acidity. Why is this important? Because it's killing the reefs. Mm-hmm. And when we kill mm-hmm. the reefs, we kill the fish. Yeah. Uh, so this is a problem. And in our last podcast, we talked about the debris in our ocean. Yes, we did. And right. yeah, so we have increased the level of debris in the ocean, which is a major environmental problem. So not only does it kill fish, it kills the coral reefs. At this point in time, we have destroyed at least 20% of the coral reefs in the world. Mm. And when we do that, we are destroying the the species the uh, that live in the ocean. So it, this is a problem. I just can't get past something real quick. We'll, uh, we'll move on yeah. in just a minute. But yeah. when you said 100 to 150% by 2100, the year 2100, <laughs> it's hard to conceptualize that year. It's, it's hard to think yeah. about 2100. That's so far away. But then you yeah. said immediately after that, you said in 80 years. That is just one person's lifetime. That's it. Yes. One person's lifetime. Yes. And it's not this futuristic, 
we're going to have flying cars and we're going to have all this stuff. I mean, we may. However, right. 2100 isn't that far away. And No, it sounds like a big number, but it's <sighs> 80 years. Just one person's lifetime. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. Sorry. That just that yeah. struck me. We will me. probably kill our oceans if we do that. Yes. Literally kill everything off in the oceans. Yeah. And, and now, I'm just, not a scientist, yeah. but I'm, that's my guess. And well, I, I, would, I would agree with that because that combined with the other, other pieces that were uh, it's literally pieces when we're talking about plastic and everything else that we've mm-hmm. done to the, yeah. It yeah. Just, I know. I, we, I always start with all the depressing stuff, and then I talk about <laughs> yeah, what we can do. I have such fun with you on these podcasts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I talk about all the horrible things, and then I talk about what the goals are, and then I talk about what we can do, because if I don't end with some hope, it can be a very depressing podcast, so yeah, we don't want to do true. that. But Yeah, and you know, it, this is another staggering number, because it's got a B after it, but three billion people depend on coastal resources for their livelihood. Mm. You know, fishing, you know, water. It, it, we don't drink the water, but, you know, there's a lot of things that we depend on from our ocean Absolutely. that we live off of. And here's another interesting statistic, which I I didn't think about, which when we talk about life on land, it makes more sense. But 30%, the oceans absorb 30% of carbon dioxide. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that either. Yeah, but think about the algae and all of that. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, processing carbon dioxide. Mm. This is important. So if we kill off the algae and the, the, um, the plankton and all of those things, it's going to not absorb carbon dioxide. Yeah. And that is going to be a problem too. And, you know, this is sort of an obvious thing, but the oceans serve as the world's largest source of protein for more than 3 billion people. 3 billion people depend on the ocean for their source of protein. Hmm. So not oh. everybody eats beef, yeah, you know, true. or chicken. They eat fish and shellfish and food from the ocean yeah. as their primary source of protein. I mean, think about it. If you live in Indonesia, that's probably what you're going to eat. Yeah. I mean, it's, so, yeah. Thinking about when you said 3 billion people, you know, depend on the, you know, ocean front for their for mm-hmm. their income and their resources that yep. makes perfect sense that you know at least three billion people would be depending on it for food uh, for the most part as well that's right. that's huge right so you know these are just some of the the statistics and and why does it matter you know i mean there's lots of reasons why it matters right because the oceans are, are a natural resource they provide food they also provide medicine mm-hmm. and now biofuels um you know, the oceans uh, break down and remove waste. Uh, think about the, the, we talked about in, in the last podcast, the little bits of plastic, That's right. right? Because it's breaking them down. That's why they're little tiny bits. That's right. Yeah. And oceans also um, do remove pollutions. We talked uh, about the carbon dioxide. It acts as a buffer from storms that, that are rolling in. Mm. You know, it's important. Healthy oceans also help mitigate climate change. We need healthy oceans. Yes. So, yeah. And healthy, you know, the oceans are, are support tourism. Yeah, absolutely. I love to go to the beach, and that is a huge part of my vacation plans. Mm-hmm. I live in a landlocked state, so I want to go to the ocean when I go on vacation. And that is a, a huge source of income for many, many, many countries. Yeah, and you, you and I have talked about that before. I'm completely landlocked, so if I had the opportunity to eat more shellfish, I would. But it's hard to trust shellfish in Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And, uh, you know, the last time we went, well, we went to Mexico, so we were on an ocean, but... Even before that, we went to South Carolina and stayed in Airbnb and, again, fueling the economies of, of multiple people, multiple countries, multiple industries. I mean, that's, that's huge and uh, right. you don't want to lose that either. Right. It's also important to think about when we don't manage the marine life, it, it, it'll, it will lead to overfishing. Um, this leads to a loss mm. of jobs. It leads to a loss of good livelihood. It increases poverty. Just in the U.S. alone, it could lead to a loss of $50 billion annually. Wow. And possibly even more than this, but $200 billion worldwide. 
My guess is it may be more than that because $50 billion in the U.S. I mean, we think about the Gulf Coast, which is a huge fishing area, Mm -hmm. um, and what happened after Katrina and the oil spill in the Gulf Coast that was devastating to the, the marine life in that area. So goals and targets, it, you know, folks can look at this on the, the UN's website. There's, there's actually a lot of goals and targets. And I, I try to focus it on just a couple because we could be here for two hours if we, focused, if we talked about all of them. But mm-hmm. just a couple of the goals that the UN has, they, they want to prevent and very significantly reduce the marine pollution of all kinds especially from from land-based activities and we we talked about in the last podcast when I talked about the the trends the sustainability trends the pollution from the fashion industry that goes into the ocean that's right so so we need to work on things like that one of the other goals is to sustainably manage and protect me, marine life and the the coastal ecosystem to not only reduce additional losses but to reverse the damage that's already been done we need to deal with this ocean acidification. We need to address the impact of that so it doesn't get so horrible by the year 2100 and maybe even try to reverse that. I, scientifically, I don't know how that happens, but there, there must be a way that they're looking at that. Mm-hmm. We need to uh, end overfishing and illegal fishing because some fish uh, in certain areas, they, they make it illegal so that it can regenerate Yes. Uh, so that we're not um, uh, making certain sp- species extinct. Uh, so certain fe- uh, species of fish become illegal for periods of time so they can regenerate. Uh, so they have to regulate harvest. And then, of course, enhance the conservation and sustainable use of our oceans and, and its resources. And I think in, in, in this area, too, there are, are ways that they are working on regenerating reef systems. So if anyone has ever gone snorkeling in any reef system, if you went 15, 20 years ago and you go now, you can see that many of the reefs are dying. Mm-hmm. And it's very tragic. Uh, I did read recently that there are eco tours <clears throat> that you can go on where you can participate in replanting coral reef systems, which I think would be fascinating. I'd actually like to do that. So you can help work on um, regenerating those those reef systems. I'm not sure how it works, but I'd like to find out. So what can we do on a local level? And and a lot of this is very local, but uh, of course, you know, re- replanting those coral reef systems would be great to do. Yeah. But on a local level, we need to make ocean friendly choices, consuming only what we need, select certified fish products. You know, so we need to pay attention to to those fish choices we are we are eating. If we know a fish is illegal in terms of um, farming or not farming, but uh, in in certain areas where they're they're not allowed to be fished, don't eat it. So we should pay attention to those pieces of things. Uh-huh. We need to reduce our carbon footprint, which helps curb the rise of of seawaters. The melting ice caps. It's important. So as we deal with the issues of climate change, we're, you know, because when those ice caps are melting, it actually increases the acidification of the ocean. Really? Yep. That's part of that process. Hmm. Um, eliminating single-use plastics, of course, mm-hmm. polluting the oceans, <laughs> breaking it down, teeny tiny pieces. Um, the sea creatures are eating them. The fish are eating them. The turtles are eating them. <laughs> I mean, it's, I can't even imagine what it's doing to their digestive systems and their bodies and how it's um, killing them and polluting them. So we need to pay attention to that. And we need to spread the word so that people who are not listening to this podcast, who are not paying attention, understand this piece. And if you do go to an area, um, if you if you go to the Caribbean, if you go to Australia and you do swim where there is a reef that may be in danger, wear reef safe sunscreen in the ocean. Mm. Even in Florida, you should be wearing reef-safe sunscreen so that we're not continuing to damage the reefs any further. And on top of that, we need to encourage companies to reduce their plastics and their packaging. Don't buy non-sustainable fish, as I mentioned. Work with companies. Vote your proxies. There's a number of mutual funds that we're working with 
that are working on packaging issues. And these are all very important. And as I've mentioned, when we've talked about the UN principles before, work with our legislators to deal with climate change issues, because I really can't say that enough. There's so much that, that can be done on a legislative basis that, uh, you know, we just have to keep hounding them and talking to them about it. So, yeah. Under Absolutely. the sea. <laughs> Under the sea, as Sebastian would say, is That's right. um, extremely important. <laughs> That is absolutely correct. And yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of things. The nice thing is, you know, your list of what we can do, it's robust. There's there's a lot that we can do yeah. and we just need to start taking action. Absolutely. Uh, so life on land. Life on land. Um, yeah. So I, I grew up in Oregon where uh, it, which is not a landlocked um, state. And, and of course, now I live in New Mexico, but um, the, the forest was part of our life. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was a... He, he worked in the logging industry, which is not always a very popular place to be, uh-huh. but that's what he did. So, you know, when we, we talk about life on land, when the UN talks about life on land, their issue is about protecting and restoring and promoting sustainability in our, in our ecosystem, in our forest system, and um, sustainably managing forests and dealing with uh, the the desertification and um, the land degradation and reversing it and halting the loss of the biodiversity that we find in our forest systems, not just about the the plants but about animals as well. Mm. You know, biodiversity loss is happening. It's as simple as that. Yes, species extinction is happening, and we have to stop it. You know, th- those are not they're not coming back. We yep. can't regrow an animal or a plant that is gone. Correct. Yeah. So I grew up in Washington. So it's it's funny that both of us are now landlocked, but we both grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Yes. And we're both around the same age. So I'm I'm sure that your family especially uh dealt with the spotted owl issue. Right. Exactly. You yes. Know, with logging and, and that was a huge, huge issue. Can't remember if it was in the in the eighties or maybe even into the early nineties, but that was one of my first introductions to issues with wildlife and, and yes, what we were doing. Too. And I, I didn't quite understand it, you know, before then, or I didn't, I guess I just didn't care because I was really young, you know, so I was like, meh, um, well, we need, you know, logs and we need paper and we need whatever. But it, it kind of opened my eyes to what that looks like. And and one of my teachers actually explained it to me. It's it's not about one spotted owl. It's not about all the spotted owls necessarily. It's mm-hmm. about what the spotted owls represent. Yes. And, uh, you know, what one animal can represent to an entire ecosystem is, is uh, amazing. So no, that's, it's, yeah, it's a huge, huge issue. And, uh, I know that you have some ideas for us and, and why it matters. Right. And well, and, and the spotted owl issue is, um, pivotal for our family mm-hmm. because it was, it was very emotional. And, and I, I do want to talk about that because, you know, we were worried about the extinction of the spotted owl. And, and again, it wasn't just about that Correct. owl. But it also put, eventually, my father out of a job. Exactly. But I cared about it as a budding environmentalist. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, when, when I realized it was putting my father out of a job, you know, I had emotions around that too. So it was a very, very difficult thing for our family. I think for a lot of families it was. so. And, and But then again, we would drive through the mountains and you would see the clear cutting, which was also devastating. And you knew there's got to be a better way. Mm-hmm. So, so it was very interesting to grow up in, in the, the mountains of Oregon and, and see what they were doing and thinking there must be a better way. And knowing, yes, there actually is <laughs> as you get older. So it's a very interesting way to grow up. But yes, why does it matter? You know... <laughs> I think it's in some ways a, a little bit obvious, but, you know, why, why do we need to keep our forests? You know, forests cover over 30% of our planet and, mm-hmm. and obviously they deal, you know, the, the forests deal with um, the carbon dioxide, right? It helps with the air we breathe, the food we eat, forests sustain us, you know, and they are rapidly being depleted. We watch the Amazon burn this year or in 2019, we watch mm-hmm. the Amazon burn and before that, in, from the year 2000 to 2015, about 
of our forests on this planet were destroyed. And that amounts to 3.3 million hectares, which is a lot. Wow. Yeah. A lot. Um, 20%. Roughly 1.6 billion people around the world depend on the forest for their livelihood. 75% of the world's poor are affected by land degradation. And we're making them poorer as we burn our forests and destroy it. 80% of the world's species of plants, animals, and insects, which are actually incredibly important, it's not just bees, but all insects, live in our forests. Mm. It's part of our biodiversity. So as we destroy the, the forests, we're destroying our biodiversity, not to mention the recreation that we get from our forests, and also the cultural and spiritual and religious values that are part of the forests. Mm -hmm. You know, they're natives in this country, in, in other countries in the Amazon. It, it's, it's a part of their spiritual and cultural beliefs as well. And I think uh, some people know this, maybe not, maybe not everybody, but many of the world's drugs and medications are found in our forests. So as we burn those down, we're losing access yep. to some of the life-saving drugs and medications. And, and some that we'll never know about. So, exactly. Some that we will never know about and may need. Natural disasters, human impact um, on climate change, uh, and and natural and as I said, the natural disasters have already cost us around three hundred three hundred billion a year in deforestation and forest degra degradation, in the loss of uh, of the habitat and species loss, the decrease in fresh water and the freshwater quality, increased soil erosion and higher carbon emissions. Um, that's per year. Mm. So as we destroy our forests, it's costing us money. Yeah. And that will only continue to increase. Yeah. And, and that's what of a lot of people care about is the money aspect. And so they need exactly. to be looking at it from this, from that point as well. Right. One of the things that we do when we work with companies is we make a um, business case mm -hmm. um, because sometimes you can't deal with it on a, ethical level <laughs> because yep. you know corporations are um, businesses and they have to they they have to work with their shareholders and and they're beholden to their shareholders so when you make it a business case you can often move management in the right direction so when you use that uh, dollar number you can move them in the right direction so it's it's helpful to have a a, a figure um, like three hundred billion dollars, or yeah. whatever it is, to their bottom line, uh -huh. um, can be can be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So again, if we focus this down into a couple of goals that the UN has um, to focus on, and and they have maybe eight or ten in in the area of of working on the forests and protecting them, but you know we'll we'll focus on a couple here, and and of course these are I, I think these are some of the most important, but they want to conserve the land that we have, they want to restore some of the forests, you know, back to their glory days, which will, will take decades and, and, and have a, a more sustainable use of what we have left um, in terms of the ecosystem and, and the forests and the wetlands. And, you know, it's not just about, you know, forests, but we have wetlands as well um, and, and the drylands. So they, they want to uh, conserve and preserve and restore what we have left. Mm -hmm. And then um, implement more sustainable management of forests, um, halt deforestation, restore again, look at uh, sustainability um, on, a, on a more global level in terms of uh, the, the reforestation process. And then look at the biodiversity of what we have left and prevent the extinction of the threatened species of both plants and animals. And I think that's uh, extremely important because I, I, I should have looked up the statistic, but I, I know there are statistics of how many species of plants and animals are, are being, you know, led to extinction probably daily and yearly. And uh, there are millions and millions of insects and that is included. And insects are important. It's not just bees. I mean, bees get all the attention, um, but insects are, are very important to our biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And also looking at resources for finance to uh, sustainable forest management because it all comes down to money Yeah, in this world. So what can we do? 
um, again, it comes back to making better choices, you know, recycling, reusing. You know, I, I think about um, there are some areas in this country where people will go and buy a home that may not be as glorious as other homes in the neighborhood, and they will literally tear it down and rebuild what I would call a McMansion. Mm-hmm. That bothers me. So um, n- totally unnecessary. So, so all of those, what now become sticks, will go into a landfill. So we need to think about that in terms of the, the waste and the, the forest products that we would then use. Like, eating a more plant-based diet also helps because that's a lot of what happens in the Amazon. They're burning it down so that they can then use the land to grow or raise cattle. Mm. Eating more locally, a more locally sourced diet also helps. Consuming only what we need. Again, looking at um, climate change, so limiting our energy usage usage, taking part in ecotourism, which also helps um, to prevent wildlife disturbances. And people think, well, hmm. what, what do you mean by that? I was going to say, <laughs> so, yeah. How does that work? Yeah. So, so when we look at ecotourism, it looks at the local culture, the local land use. It looks at not disturbing the wildlife and the species in the area. So they're much more in tune with what's happening locally, whereas a non-ecotourism type adventure doesn't pay attention to that. So ecotourism, if you think about a safari in Africa, a photo safari is going to pay much more attention to what the animals are doing and keeping a safe distance as opposed to what you would think of as a traditional safari. Gotcha. So that's probably the easiest way. And then, of course, when using the forest, whether it's locally or somewhere else, please be more mindful and protect and support the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Stay on the path. It's there for a purpose. And participate in your your local, you know, cleanup days and rebuild those paths if they get destroyed because you're using them too. And um, so support that. Yeah, absolutely. Those are definitely things that we can all do on a a local and even national level uh, to to support our life on the land. Yes, absolutely. And and I I know that your entire practice revolves around helping people to um, fulfill what they want to do with their finances that that honors their beliefs when it comes to the environment and and other things in their life. So if, if somebody's listening to this podcast and they say, you know what, I... There, there is a lot of bad news in some of these podcasts, but she's got a lot of great ideas and she's got a lot of input and insight into what we can do. And I, I love where her heart is at. If they want to reach out and have a conversation about kind of changing some of the things that they do or maybe becoming more active in or proactive maybe is the, the better word in engaging these companies and corporations. And, and we know we've talked about that in previous podcasts, how that, how that works if they're interested in contacting you to talk to you about that, how do they get a hold of you? What's the best way? Yes. So they can reach us by phone, 505-982-9661, or by email at info at horizonssfs.com. And we love what we do. We love knowing that our investments are so impactful and and it's about what the client wants, what the client's interested in, and tailoring their investments to what's important to them. And it's it's just amazing knowing that when a client walks in here and they feel very disappointed about where their current portfolios are and what those things are invested in, and we can sit down with them and they say, how can we move the needle in a different direction and we tailor those investments to something that they feel more positive about, they leave feeling so much better and yeah. more positive. And, and we just have great conversations about it, which is what inspires me to do what I do every day and why I really love what I do. Because I feel like people feel a lot more hopeful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, that's really what we need to do and, and what we need to be feeling because otherwise it would not be a lot of fun <laughs> in so many ways. So yeah, absolutely. It's and, great. And yeah. I will say this. If you're listening to this, 
how if you're working with a financial professional, how often do does your financial professional help you fulfill a soul need? And that's how I put it. it, it to me, this is yeah. a soul need. When you when you have this on your mind and your heart, and you want to make a difference. Most financial professionals out there, whether it be an advisor or, or any other financial professional, they don't take a lot of this into account. And it's all about, you know, what can I do to give you the best returns and make you a bunch of money or, or try to? That's not exactly what this is all about. That's not what our time here on earth is about. And so if you're interested in, in kind of putting your money where your mouth is or where your heart is and fulfilling a soul need, uh, I, I would encourage you to reach out to Kim and her team. They're fantastic. They do a great job. So, Kim, thank you so much. Again, very educational podcast. A lot of hope with this one on what we can do to uh, to make some of these changes and kind of line up with what the UN is trying to to accomplish. And I appreciate your time. Thanks, Eric. I, I love doing this. I love talking about this stuff. And I love knowing that we can move the needle in the right direction and make a difference in this world. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And audience, I want to thank you for listening to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Gray O'Kyle. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Kim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Horizons Sustainable Financial Services, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Deep Impact Investing Podcast, the sustainable, responsible, impact investing podcast that shows you how to get your voice heard. It's time to start investing like you give a damn. To ask a question that we can answer on an upcoming podcast, email us at info at horizonssfs.com or join the conversation on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash horizons sustainable financial services or give us a call at 505-982-9661 don't forget to click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available the companies we may speak about during our podcast are not recommendations for investment only you and your financial advisor can determine what the right investments are for you and your situation horizon sustainable financial services is a registered investment advisor registered with the state of new mexico and other jurisdictions were registered or exempted. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the host and or guest and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.